In this video, you're going to learn Karen Clymer's top 10 tips for Florida real estate math. A lot of people sweat over the math questions, but there's really no reason to. If you know how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you can nail the math questions on the Florida real estate sales associate exam. I'm Karen Clymer from Orlando, Florida. I passed the Florida real estate exam the first time I took it, and since 2003, I've been teaching my students to do the same thing. Today you're going to learn what you need to know to nail the math portion of the Florida real estate exam. Unfortunately, much of the advice you hear from real estate instructors doesn't work. I've heard instructors tell people not to worry about the math questions. That is terrible advice. On the contrary, you need to get 10 out of 10 on the math. And that's my first tip. Tip number one is to get 10 out of 10 on the math. What does that mean? There are 10 math questions on the Florida Real Estate Sales Associate exam. You need to get all 10 of them correct. I've talked to hundreds of people who have failed the state exam. Usually they score in the high 60s or the low 70s. But if they had gotten 10 out of 10 on the math, they would have passed. For example, someone gets a 72 but got 5 out of 10 on the, of the math correct. If that person had gotten all of the math questions correct, they would be walking out with a real estate license instead of a fail sheet. So my first tip is to take the math seriously and focus on getting 10 out of 10 of the math questions correct. Tip number two, use a calculator for everything. If you need to add two plus two, do it in your calculator. Why do I say that? Well, you might have to figure out what 10% of 10,000 is. On a normal day, you might be able to do that in your head and figure out that it's a thousand. But when you're under pressure in a stressful situation, you might do it in your head and think a hundred. I mean, sometimes I do that when I'm not under pressure. It's just an easy mistake to make that's not based on your understanding of the question. Rather, it's simple carelessness. So just to be safe, do all the math in your calculator. Tip number three, use the same calculator for practice as you do for the exam. For the state exam, you need a plain old vanilla calculator. You cannot use a cell phone. You cannot use a calculator that makes noise. You cannot use a calculator with paper, even if there's no paper in it. You cannot use a calculator that allows you to store formulas or words. You just want a plain old simple calculator and you need to be using that calculator when you study. Think about this, on your personal cell phone or your computer, you know where everything is. You've got all the apps where you want them, you have your preferences set how you like them. If you try to do something on a friend's cell phone, you can use it. I mean, there are certain things about cell phones that are universal, but it's just not as comfortable as your own. You can't find the apps immediately, it's a different operating system. It even feels different in your hand. Calculators are the same way. All calculators are basically the same, but they're also a little bit different. The buttons are different sizes, they're in different places. Sometimes the buttons even do different things. This is particularly true with the equal sign and the percent sign buttons. You need to be very comfortable with your calculator. You don't need to be sitting there in the state exam trying to figure out the idiosyncrasies of this calculator that you picked up on the way to the test center. So buy a calculator and use it when you're studying and practicing. Tip number four is to do the math questions during class and study time. When I'm going over math in class, there are some students who will sit and watch me do it like it's a show. There are other students who will pull out their calculator and do it along with me. Who do you think learns it better? If you watch some of my YouTube videos, I know they're enjoyable, but don't watch them like a movie. Pull out a pen and paper and do it along with me. Better yet, pause the video, try it on your own before I solve it, and then watch the rest of the video. I guarantee you'll learn more. It's the same thing when you're doing questions in your book. Read the question and try to do it on your own before you look anything up. Actually try certain math formulas before you look up how to do it. That time you spend struggling with the question is so important. Tip number five, read the last sentence of the question. This is how to figure out which formula goes with which question. A frequent problem my students have once they've learned about five different formulas is that they can't figure out which formula to use with which problem. They'll read the question, 
They know all of the formulas, but they don't know which formula to use with this question. So they just start putting numbers in the calculator. That doesn't work. Here's a better way. Read the entire paragraph, then read the last sentence of the paragraph. That one sentence is the actual question. This tells you the type of math problem. Here's an example. If the question reads, a home was purchased with a down payment of $45,000 and a loan of $210,000 at 6.5% for 30 years. Monthly payments are $1,261.54. What is the loan to value ratio? The last sentence says, what is the loan to value ratio? So that tells you the, what type of problem this is. In this case, of course, it's a loan to value ratio problem. So at this point, the whole long story is irrelevant. The last sentence is what tells you what formula to use. If it asks for percent profit, the formula is made overpaid. If it says prorate, then it's a proration formula. If it says, what is the cap rate? then it's I over RV. As you're learning the formulas, learn the question that goes with them. Tip number six is to write down the formula. Once you know the formula is loan to value, actually write that down on your paper. A few of the formulas are too long to write down, but most of the formulas are just a few letters or words. So write that down. Then all you have to do is plug in the numbers that you need. So why do I suggest that? Well, a common scenario on the state exam is that they'll give you extra information that doesn't matter. I call this problem trash. So let's go back to that same question. A home was purchased with a down payment of $45,000 and a loan of $210,000 at 6.5% for 30 years. Monthly payments are $1,261.54. What is the loan to value ratio? Most of the numbers in that question are irrelevant. We don't need the interest rate, we don't need the 30-year term, we don't need the monthly payment. If you write down the formula and only focus on the numbers you need, then the problem trash won't bother you. If you read the paragraph and immediately start punching in numbers in your calculator, you're going to use numbers that you don't need. Tip number seven, if you get the question wrong, repeat it exactly as you just did it. Sometimes you'll solve the problem, but your answer is not one of the four choices. If that happens, the first thing you should do is repeat exactly what you just did. That doesn't make any sense. Why do I suggest that? It's very easy to make a calculator typo. You meant to type 0.1, but you typed 0.01, or you meant to do 1.5%, but you did 15%. So if your answer doesn't match any of the choices, repeat exactly what you just did. And if you still get it wrong, it's time to come up with plan B. But try repeating plan A first, because it might have just been a calculator typo. Tip number eight, check your work. In the carpentry world, they say measure twice, cut once. That applies to the real estate exam, too. Here's a question for you. A soda and chips cost $1.10 together. The chips cost a dollar more than the soda. How much did the soda cost? If you're anything like my students, there's a good chance you said 10 cents. That's one of the choices. Should we move on or should we check it? Let's just check it for fun. If the soda is 10 cents, the chips are a dollar more, so that makes it a dollar 10. Dollar 10 plus 10 cents is a dollar 20. I'm glad we checked it. That could have been the difference between a score of 74, which is failing, and 75, which is passing. So check your work. Tip number nine, try all of the answers. If you don't know how to do the question, you can always try all of the answers. There's a way to use simple algebra to solve that soda and chips question. I'll include the algebraic equation in the description for you math lovers. But let's say you forgot everything about algebra as soon as you finished high school. No problem. The non-algebra way to do it is to try all of the answers. This isn't the most efficient way to do it, but it's just as effective. With choice A, if the soda is five cents, the chips would be 105. That's 110. That's right, but let's check all the answers just to be sure. If a soda is 10 cents, the chips are $1.10. That adds up to 120. That's too much. C says that the soda is a dollar, so the chips are $2. That's way too much. 
And D says the soda is 105, so that the chips are 205. That's also way too much. So the answer is A. The soda costs five cents. Again, this isn't the correct way to do it, but we aren't being graded on our method. We're being graded on our results. So don't be afraid to use this method if you need to. Tip number 10, be sure the number they give you is the number you need. In the previous example about loan to value, we needed the loan amount. The question gave us the value and the down payment, but not the loan amount. Now it's pretty easy to figure out the loan amount by subtracting the down payment from the value, but it's also just as easy to miss that and use one of the given numbers thinking it's what you need. Sometimes the question will give you the monthly payment, but what you actually need is the annual payment, so you have to multiply your number times 12. Conversely, they might give you the annual income, but you need the monthly. Of course, in this case, you just divide by 12. Sometimes when you're under pressure, it's easy to forget this. Just be sure that you're using monthly when you need monthly and yearly when you need yearly. Don't assume that the number they give you is exactly what you need. I promised you 10 tips, but here's one more tip that's actually more of a warning. The state's wrong answers are good wrong answers. Remember, this test is written by professional test writers. These are people who spend their days coming up with test questions. These questions don't have one right answer and three random numbers. They have one right answer and three answers that are derived using very common mistakes. This is why you need to know the formulas. This is why you need to check your work. This is why you can't let your guard down for one minute. Those are my top 10 tips that I hope will help you pass the Florida Real Estate Sales Associate exam. The exam is difficult, but it's not impossible. Every month, around 2,000 people pass the Florida Real Estate exam. By following these tips, you will increase your odds of success. If you found this video useful, please subscribe and leave a comment below right now. Further, if you need any help studying or you need help getting your real estate career started, please give me a call. I'd be happy to help you.